Welcome to EPG Patshala. This paper is the philosophy of law. The current module is entitled Theories of Justice with reference to Amartya Sen, Michael Walser, and Joseph Ratz. The objectives of this module are to understand the contribution that Sen, Walser, and Ratz have made to the idea of justice. The author of this module is Bharat Kumar from IIT Indore. I'm Akash Singh Rator from Lewis University of Rome. In the previous module, we discussed the idea of justice in relation to John Rawls and uh, Ronald Dworkin. Now we continue the uh, political philosophical understanding of justice with respect to three other important contributors, Sen, Walzer, and Ratz. In the previous module, we had mentioned that justice is one of the most important moral and political concepts. It's the ideal morally correct conception of the state of things for political society. As we've discussed in the previous module, the concept of justice differs over culture, different places, and different uh, periods. As we had mentioned with reference to Plato, Aristotle, uh, uh, various Persian and Muslim political philosophers, uh, and uh, Gandhi, and so on, the conception of justice might differ in relation to the cultural uh, various cultural factors and, and ideas. What we want to focus on, uh, focus attention on in this module is that very frequently the central issue in theories of justice concentrates on unequal relationships between people in, uh, in the current society. The unequal relationships with respect to political power, with respect to social standing, and with respect to the receipt and distribution of uh, social goods. So we have uh, one conception of uh, justice that appears in uh, roles that was highly influential, influential on all of these uh, subsequent political and legal theorists. But the uh, orientation uh, in this latter group, uh, Sand, Walzer, and Ratz, tends towards understanding um, issues of tension uh, social inequities and uh, injustice. And in that respect, it differs slightly from the more liberal political philosophers that uh, we discussed in the previous module. So let's begin with Amartya Sen. In Amartya Sen's great uh, uh, and recent uh, work, The Idea of Justice, Sen attempts to reconsider the influence of uh, Rawls in the uh, domain of justice, the influence that Rawls had upon Sen himself, and finally coming to terms with uh, what he refers to as his break with uh, Rawls's theory of justice. Nevertheless, uh, Sen uh, uh, dedicates uh, the, uh, the work to uh, the spirit of uh, John Rawls from whom he had learned so much. But there's a fundamental uh, difficulty that Sen finds with the Rawlsian idea of justice, and he categorizes that as transcendental institutionalism. The idea is that Rawls seems to suggest that justice is somehow transcendental. It works the same way, according to the same principles, in any place and uh, over any time. That Sen has so much uh, practical experience of the way injustice plays out all over the world um, makes him uh, dubious about the fundamental transcendental idea of justice that Rawls puts forward. Sen argues instead that rather than thinking about some ideal theory of uh, justice that uh, functions through a flawless set of rules that can be implemented anywhere at any time, looking around the world what we see the most deep need for is a way to prevent the manifest injustice that is uh, everywhere perceivable. So Rawls had uh, concentrated on articulating an ideal conception of justice that can be used as the model or the basis for judging various political societies to determine how just they actually are. So we know how just something is in relation to a certain ideal. And it was the ideal theory of justice that Rawls was working on. Sen, on the contrary, due in large part to his um, uh, empirical economic uh, research, has realized uh, and, and explains in the idea of justice that manifest injustice, the uh, continuing um, poverty uh, that uh, plagues a great deal of the world, the um, unequal uh, 
uh, manifest unequal access to resources that people enjoy and many of the other problems that are rampant throughout the world force us to stop dreaming about some ideal theory of justice and instead come up with very practical uh, implementable uh, conceptions or ideas of justice that can be employed right away to help remove manifest injustice. So we're moving from an ideal theory of justice to a workable idea of justice in order to prevent manifest injustice. So how does Sen uh, hope to achieve this? Sen calls into question the fundamentally deontological approach of justice that we find in Rawls and he puts forward more of a consequentialist approach instead. Now he doesn't refer to his, his approach as consequentialist in the classic debate between deontology and consequentialism, but he does, by using, uh, introducing new uh, terms uh, uh, from classical Indian philosophy, niti and nyaya, he does seem to give um, clear indication that his approach is consequentialist. Now, before I go forward, let me back up and define some of these terms. The deontological approach is concerned fundamentally with principles, while the consequentialist approach is concerned with consequences. So we can consider an act just because the act is in perfect accordance with a certain principle of justice, or alternatively, we could consider an act just because of the consequences that arise in uh, uh, in the, uh, as a result of the act that was performed. So Sen wants to lead us away from this principled approach which blends into the transcendental institutionalism of the ideal theory of justice in Rawls and push us more towards considering the consequences of our actions and our organizations since these are the things that are going to be necessary to remove manifest injustice. Ide an ideal has to be translated into a viable practice for injustice to be eliminated. Consequently, Sen seems to promote more consequentialism and move away from deontology. The way he does this is by introducing those terms, niti and nyaya. Sen refers to niti as the organizational propriety and behavioral norms. In contrast, na nyaya stands for actual social realization, going beyond the organizational rules and norms. So in some respects, though this is not a completely accurate parallel, in some respects, niti corresponds to the deontological, while nyaya corresponds to the consequential. Nyaya is to deliver justice on the ground. It's concerned with what emerges and how it affects the actual lives of people and those lives that people actually are capable of leading, rather than articulating lives in some bookish sense according to an ideal theory. Niti is about rules and institutions and Nyaya about their realization. So in this respect, we can think of Niti as the um, uh, deontological aspect, Nyaya in terms of realization as the consequentialist aspect. Now, Sen argues that both Niti and Nyaya are essential. And in that, in that respect, uh, the claim that he uh, is consequentialist as opposed to deontological is not uh, uh, fully accurate. That's why we have mentioned that these are in some way parallels, but Niti isn't purely deontology and Nyaya isn't purely consequentialism. Niti and Nyaya are both fundamentally necessary. However, unless the principles of Niti are actually translated into Nyaya, into the con into the uh, pragmatic consequences of those principles, then justice is certainly not achieved. It's of no use at all having an ideal of justice if it cannot be implemented on the ground. So part of the reason that Sen made these innovations in the idea of justice over the um, ideal theory proposed by Rawls was that he suggested that fundamental agreement about the ideal principles of justice are much more difficult to achieve, in fact we have as yet uh, failed to achieve them, as opposed to certain compromises that can be reached with respect to the elimination of manifest injustice. So the argument is, 
it's much easier for us to agree on how to get rid of manifest injustice than it is for us to agree upon the ideal of justice. Some critics have said, why is that so? Why do you believe that that's necessarily so? If the same rational processes that allow us to come together to eliminate manifest injustices can be actualized, why can't they be further um, oriented towards the uh, discovery of the ideal of justice. This is uh, a, one critique that certain people have made about uh, Sen's uh, idea of justice. The more trenchant and common critique, on the other hand, is against his consequentialism or his apparent consequentialism as such. You will remember from the previous module on Rawls that the introduction of a theory of justice in 1971 was Rawls's intervention into the dominance of utilitarian theory in political philosophy. Utilitarian theory is a consequentialist theory. So as opposed to the deontological idea that justice is attached to a principle, in utilitarian theory, justice is an outcome or a consequence. So much of the critique of Sen's position is to reinforce the Rawlsian uh, principled conception over against the apparent consequentialist and in some respects utilitarian conception that Sen seems to be putting forward. Of course, it's not entirely clear that Sen does have any such account since he is a fundamentally concerned with maintaining Niti within his account uh, as well. Now let's move on to Michael Walzer's work. Michael Walzer is once again a political philosopher who uh, wrote in response to the increasing importance of Rawls's liberalism within the uh, uh, Anglo-American conception of, uh, of political philosophy. Walzer is commonly referred to as, as articulating a communitarian uh, perspective in um, opposition to the liberal uh, perspective represented by Rawls. In his major book, Spheres of Justice, Walzer defines equality in terms of simple equality and complex equality. The reason he begins his uh, work uh, about justice, articulating a conception of equality, is clear when you think about uh, Rawls's two principles of justice as being a kind of uh, harmony or negotiation to be found between the first principle of liberty and the second principle of equality. So just as uh, Ronald Dworkin in reaction to Rawls had concentrated or focused on equality in a corrective measure uh, through his interpretation of Rawls, Walzer himself concentrates on equality in order to, uh, uh, to in order to um, articulate his own conception of, of justice in this book, Spheres of Justice. When Walzer uses the term simple equality, he refers to the absence of monopolies over social goods, that is, the property which belongs to any sphere. Now, these spheres can be, for example, the economic sphere or the political sphere or the social sphere. Now, equality is enjoyed in each of these spheres, and they may be asymmetrically enjoyed in each of them. In other words, we might have a certain economic equality, but enjoy absolutely no political or social equality. We might enjoy social equality, but have no political or economic uh, parity, and so on. So Walzer's concern is to point out that there are certain spheres of justice and not just some uniform idea of justice as presented in Rawls's work. Rawls's work seems to articulate a conception of justice that's more suitable for a non-plural society. Now please keep in mind that Walzer is writing in reaction to a theory of justice and when Rawls himself produces his second major work, Political Liberalism, he has many of Walzer's critiques in mind in the way that he corrects the idea of justice from theory of justice and introduces justness in a politically diverse society in his second major book, Political Liberalism. That tells us two things. It tells us on the one hand that Walzer's critique is quite strong and powerful, but it also tells us that Rawls has um, given us a, um, 
uh, a reply that uh, uh, to which Walser uh, does not reply in, in, in spheres of justice. Complex equality refers to the transit between these spheres of justice. So the argument that Walzer makes is that uh, inequalities in one sphere should not invade the uh, equality enjoyed in another sphere. So no citizen standing in no, uh, the political sphere, for example, should influence his standing in the economic sphere. No citizen standing in the social sphere should influence his standing in the economic sphere. Now, this is speaking somewhat abstractly, but you can understand it concretely in this respect. Why should it be that somebody who has uh, political uh, inequality should consequently also suffer social and economic inequality? Contrarywise, Walzer comes up with a series of blocking techniques. Walzer comes up with a series of blocking techniques. He refers to it as a system of blocked exchanges. Now, what the system of blocked exchanges does is it prevents inequalities from bleeding into other spheres and it um, prevents, for example, the opposite of what I had just articulated. Why should somebody who has advantages in the economic sphere be able to buy political power? So this is a concrete understanding of what he's saying. We have different spheres where injustice works, economic, social, political, and the real causes of inequality are not simple inequalities, they're compound. In other words, the very fact that people who have a great deal of money can then capture uh, uh, advantages in the other spheres. So I have a, an enormous amount of wealth, this is an inequality in the economic sphere, and I use that inequality in the economic sphere to create inequalities in the political sphere by buying political power. I use that political and economic power to buy social capital, and so on. So Walzer's main critique of Rawls in this respect is that Rawls thinks about inequality in a simple manner. He doesn't understand the notion of complex inequalities. And Walzer, in Spheres of Justice, puts forward the system of blocked exchanges in order to correct some of the defects of the Rawlsian conception, which he argues is based on a simple understanding of, um, of equality. Now let's move on to some critique of Walzer's view on justice. In Walzer's imagined political community, there is no otherness, but uh, there's just a reflection in this community of oneness. So it seems something like a mono monolithic political society. If this is Walzer's position, then how can an imagined community come to an understanding, for example, of which shared resources should be divided? And what are the values of that resource? In other words, the particularism that Walzer proposes makes it seem rather difficult to abstract to a level of social consensus that can justify the decisions that are made so they can be seen to be just decisions. How do we come up with that um, uh, mechanism for agreement and, uh, and justified disagreement? This is not clear in Walzer's work. Now we move on to the legal and political philosopher Joseph Ratz. We've already discussed Ratz in an earlier module on legal positivism in relation to the, the tension between the natural law uh, uh, theories and the positivist theories. And we described Ratz there as an exclusive law legal positivist. In this module, however, we're going to think more about Ratz's political theory rather than his legal theory. For Ratz, there's a natural connection supportive connection, he calls it, between individual interests and the general interests of society. In the common good, there's a harmonious relationship between individual interests and general welfare. Well, why do we start with this idea of the individual and the community? We've already seen in Walzer's work, and to some extent in Sen's work, that the contribution of John Rawls to political philosophy, his political liberalism, opened up a possibility of dispute between the individualism that's advocated by Rawls and the more community or general interests that are advocated by 
consequentialists on the one hand or by communitarians like Walzer on the other hand. So what Ratz is attempting to do in his political philosophy is come up with certain principles that harmonize individual interest with community interests. In other words, as we've seen an argument go between the liberals and the communitarians over whether you value the individual or you value the community that makes the individual possible, we have Rawls on one side and Walzer on another. What Ratz attempts to do is to intervene in this debate and accommodate both the individual interest and the general interest. And he refers to this as the supportive connection, which allows the individual interest's welfare to increase at the same time as the general welfare. Now let's see how he affects this harmony of these two opposing viewpoints. Joseph Ratz argues that there are four essential things in order for us to realize the goal of the common good without simultaneously violating the individual good. Now keep in mind that the problem that Rawls had was that utilitarians would violate the individual good in favor of the common good. And the problem that communitarians have with Rawls is that he would seem to violate the good of the community in favor of his individualistic approach. So what Ratz is giving us here is the goal of increasing the common good without violating the individual good through four essential points. The first point is that the justification of political authority has to be grounded on a political morality that protects individual freedom. This is an abstract way of referring to the idea of sovereignty. How do we understand sovereignty? Why does the nation have a certain um, sovereignty or control or power or authority over us? What Ratz is suggesting is that we have to conceptualize sovereignty, the authority of the state, in terms of individual political freedom. So in other words, the reason the state has sovereignty over all of us is because it gets that sovereignty through our freedom. To think about it in the other way, if the state imposes upon our freedom, it reduces its authority, its sovereignty. So if we connect necessarily individual political freedom with the sovereignty of the state, then we can create a mechanism whereby if the state uses its sovereignty for the collective good by uh, uh, infringing on our individual good, it in the process reduces its legitimacy and its authority over us because all sovereignty derives from individual freedom. The second principle that uh, Ratz suggested is that the state should be anti-perfectionist. In other words, a perfectionist state is a robust state that pursues the good of individuals. An anti-perfectionist is a liberal or minimal state that merely concentrates on the fundamental rights of its citizens. So Sen can be said to advocate a more robust, a more perfectionist account of what the state can do. After all, he thinks that the state has the mechanisms to understand the nature of differences between people and respond to them. Rawls thinks quite the contrary. The state has no such mechanism in order to understand the nature of specific injustices and so has to work towards uh, principles. The libertarian is the most anti-perfectionist conception of the state. For the libertarian, the state has basically only two functions, to protect people from within, from each other, and to protect the citizens from without, from other citizens. So the security of citizens, um, the protection of one citizen from another citizen, and the protection of that community of citizens from foreign citizens. These are the only two things that the state needs to do. Everything else is laissez-faire. The economy is free, the society is free, uh, there's no moral imputations and so on. This is the most anti-perfectionist state. So you, in this gradation of anti-perfectionism, of libertarianism, the a little more perfectionism in uh, political liberalism, even more perfectionism in consequentialism and uh, Sen's idea, and perhaps, though it's not clear, uh, the same or more perfectionism in the communitarian thought of uh, Walzer, 
What Ratz suggests is that the state should be um, anti-perfectionist. So he's down towards the libertarian side in this respect. The only thing that the state should do is to protect the fundamental rights of its citizens. It doesn't have other obligations. And in this way, he argues, the common good will be secured because if you promote the individual good, you have a tendency to secure the common good. The third principle that he proposes is that we should have a faith in personal autonomy and freedom of choice and a recognition that each person wants to realize his, what he calls, life project. Now these are very strange words. Faith in personal autonomy, freedom of choice, and the realization of a life project. The interactions in legal theory between R Ronald Dworkin and Joseph Ratz in terms of the legal positivism debate, exclusionary pos positivism versus um, inclusionary positivism of the sort of uh, Dworkin, that uh, series of debates that Ratz had with Dworkin also seemed to have influenced Ratz's political uh, philosophy. So the debates that they had in legal theory uh, turned out to influence Ratz's uh, political theory. And you can understand this third idea about faith and personal autonomy, freedom of choice, and the life project in terms of Dworkin's conception of dignity, and um, authenticity. Finally, the fourth uh, component of uh, Ratz's view is the importance of, that political freedom has to promote individual freedom. In other words, as Walzer had mentioned, there are spheres of justice. The political sphere is just one, but the political sphere is quite important because the state is an anti-perfectionist state that is just fixated on rights and not robustly on goods. However, how does the state orient itself towards those rights, that political freedom? Ratz's view is that the realization of political freedom should be a precondition for a, person, a person's ability or capability in sense language to enjoy all the other aspects of individual freedom. So when we have uh, concentration on an individual's political freedom, we do that with the end that that freedom can be translated into other what Walzer would call spheres of justice. So uh, my political freedom should not be infringed such that my economic or my social um, uh, life is not uh, reduced. Rather, my political freedom should be um, uh, promoted by the state in such a way that it can be translated into social freedom and economic freedom and so on. So Ratz's argument is that through these four mechanisms we can come to a kind of harmony between the individual good and the general welfare. So now let's move on to a critique of Ratz's view. Well the most obvious critique is that the common good doesn't always represent some sort of unity of individual interests, as he suggests. If you recall in his second suggestion, the more we concentrate on the individual's good, the more the common good will result as a consequence. But this has a hidden premise. The hidden premise is that the common good is a result of each individual's good put together. Now, what reason do we have to believe that? Some aspects of the common good may be harmonious with one's well-being, but other aspects may indeed um, hinder the same person's well-being. So we have already the classic utilitarian problem. The utilitarian problem that Rawls saw was that in pursuit of the general interest, the individual's interest is not recognized. What Ratz is proposing is if you recognize the individual interest, then you necessarily pursue the common interest. But neither Rawls nor utilitarians agree with this viewpoint. So it's not clear where Ratz or how Ratz justifies this assumption. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, can a liberal culture guarantee the common good without coming into conflict with individual well-being? In other words, after 
Ratz's um, interesting defense of the unity of individual and common interests, we are still left somewhat unsatisfied with the basic debate that's going on between Sen, Rawls, and Walzer. So, now we sum up. Whereas Amartya Sen's approach is focused on a realization-focused comparativism, in Michael Walzer's approach, we realize that there's some sort of monopolistic control of a dominant good. Then we moved on to Joseph Ratz, where we saw that he was working on an, an effort to find a compatibility between the individual and the common good. So all of these interventions, very important interventions in recent political philosophy, have produced various perspectives on this crucial idea of justice that um, uh, came onto the scene with the original publication of Rawls's theory of justice in 1971. Thank you.